Uh, how is the lens? Good. Uh, of course, like whenever we have lens, we feel a little tired. So, can everyone just uh, stand up for just two seconds and kind of stretch their hands up in the air so that we can bring in the energy back into the room? Thank you so much. Just we'll do it uh, two, two times and just stretch and uh, feel relaxed and uh, ready for the session. Uh, so before we begin you know, today's session, uh, how many of you folks work ha or have worked with machine learning? So I see a fair amount. And how many of you are aware of the basic concepts of what is the machine learning model? Of course, these days we are looking at generative AI. How many of you have explored generative AI, like used ChatGPT or Claude, Gemini? So I would say majority of the majority of the users. So of course, the primary kind of question that comes to our mind is that how can these powerful AI systems get deployed, right? How many of you have probably asked this question to yourself or probably asked this question to your, uh, to your colleagues or to your friends that how can such powerful models be there? How can I perhaps myself build such kind of a model? How many of you have probably thought about this? So of course, today's session will help you to answer all of those questions. Uh, we are living in a very specialized uh, phase right now, which is, of course, the phase of generative AI. And most of these AI models have been trained over a lot of data. So, in fact, like there's a statistic that the original chat GPT model, which is the GPT 3.5 that came out, uh, the entire Wikipedia itself was just 0.6% of the entire training set. So, these uh, models have been trained with images, with textual data, with GitHub repositories, with more than millions and billions of different type of documents that are available across the entire internet. So of course, when it comes to being able to train them, it requires a lot of compute. So with machine learning, you might have probably heard from time to time that, of course, with machine learning, everything is mathematical, right? Uh, all the compute that takes place, takes place through these um, tensors which are essentially n-dimensional, multi-dimensional arrays and all of the calculations that take place are different kinds of, uh, you know, different types like probability and then of course other kind of algorithms that are being used. And when it comes to these kind of models such as uh, these gen AI models, uh, large language models that we typically use today, uh, they require a lot of computer. So how can we of course overcome all of these different challenges when it comes to having to deal with these large models and especially how do we actually deploy them so that we can get to a level somewhat similar to what a chat GPT or an open AI kind of company would actually do, right? So that's what we're going to be covering today, how you can basically run uh, machine learning workloads on Kubernetes and Kubeflow, speci uh, specifically Calm Kubeflow, which is a distribution of Kubeflow from Canonical and BioBundu. And we'll understand why is it required and how you can actually become this that. So quick introduction about myself. I'm Shivai. I am a Google Super Code mentor for Kubeflow uh, for the year of 2024. And I'm also a developer evangelist at Couchbase. It's a NoSQL database platform. And I'm grateful for uh, my company to be, to be able to support my travel over here at uh, UbuCon Asia. And I'm also a Cloud Native Computing Foundation ambassador. And you can connect with me on my Twitter at GreatHowDevelop if you have any sort of questions or any discussion that you might want to have regarding Charm, Qflow, or, or just, uh, the machine learning uh, ecosystem in general, I'll be more than happy to answer any of your questions. Uh, of course, uh, just a quick outline of what we we'll covered today. So we'll be running, we'll be talking about how you can run machine learning workloads on Kubernetes. What is Qflow? Uh, how to actually set up Charm, Qflow, and uh, then we'll have a small demo of uh, how Charm, Qflow looks like. And then we'll have a use case where you'll find that how you can actually leverage the capability of being able to fine tune these really large models inside of Charm Qflow and then use it in a real world application. So that's the basic outline. And of course, I'll be around after my talk if you have any questions, if you just want to connect with me regarding uh, the machine learning landscape in general, if you are exploring machine learning, I'll be more than happy to answer some of your questions uh, regarding all of that. But of course, uh, how many how many folks over here are aware of containers, Docker, Kubernetes? Can anyone give like a one-liner explanation of what Kubernetes is in your own words? Yeah, container orchestration. Container orchestration. That means that you have a bunch of containers 
which are essentially these single package applications which are derived from application code that you package inside of these containers and then you deploy them on Kubernetes in order to be able to scale them up. So of course, of course, sometimes you might not just uh, be only enough like having one container, but if you want to scale it up, especially if you're building uh, an application that needs to scale for billions of users, then you can use an orchestration technology like Kubernetes. And of course, uh, it can help you with your deployment of your applications and for scaling up your applications, depending on the load and the load balancing required based on the amount of traffic that's coming to your application. So it's a great open source project. And of course, uh, there is a dedicated um, Kubernetes distribution called as MicroKates. You probably might have heard of it if you are active in the Ubuntu ecosystem. And we'll be using that today in order to deploy our Charm Kubeflow instance with the help of Canonical uh, or on Ubuntu. Now, first, let's talk about the machine learning infrastructure landscape on Kubernetes. Now, I gave two examples. Uh, how many of you have heard about XAI, which is a company by Elon Musk? So, they are themselves building their own large language models called Grok. Now, if anyone of you have used Twitter, you might have seen Grok shown up on Twitter. It's one of the most amazing models. It's very open as well. So, in fact, like if you ask it to uh, make an image, it has a really powerful image generation tool. If you ask it to generate an image of, like, let's say, Elon Musk hugging Mark Zuckerberg, which in real life would not happen ever, right? Because they want to fight with each other, but you, you can actually generate an image of them uh, hugging each other, which would never happen on an child PPT kind of system or a Gemini. So it's a massive project right now, and they are also hiring a lot of talented engineers. So if you are active in machine learning, if you're active in Kubernetes Cloud, I would highly recommend applying to XCI. Like they have a wonderful uh, tech behind what's powering them. And uh, they are leveraging a lot of their machine learning deployments on the uh, on the top of multitudes of Kubernetes clusters, which is, which are powering their entire large language model ecosystem. Then, of course, OpenAI is a great example. They have been deploying all of their model training right from when they started with GPT 3.5, now all the way to GPT 4.0, GPT 4.0 Mini. So, all of their training and, of course, the chat GPT API. Uh, or the OpenAI API that all of us love to use, all of them are getting trained and of course getting deployed on multitude of different complex Kubernetes clusters. There is an entire case study on the Kubernetes website that I will recommend to all of you to look at. And of course, why these companies are reliant on training and inferencing of all of their cutting edge large language models on Kubernetes because Kubernetes is now uh, 10 years old and it is um, the de facto standard when it comes to being able to get safe deployments. Yes, it might be a bit difficult to get started with. Uh, there is a bit of a learning curve, but it is the standard solution if you are wanting to get uh, optimized and you know, like if you're if you want to scale up your machine learning applications, it is the platform to do so. Uh, so of course, whenever we talk about machine learning, there are three different categories of primary hardware that are required for you to run machine learning workloads, starting off with CPUs. Of course, if you have smaller models, you can leverage CPU, but of course, now if you have such kind of larger models, you will need more specialized hardware that can actually do more number of mathematical compute per second. So that is why like graphical processor units or even tensor processor units, which are specialized hardware, uh, which can do all of these machine learning uh, calculations are what are usually recommended if you are running much larger models. So of course, the basic question is that how do you integrate GPUs inside of Kubernetes? So essentially, there are two different parts. One is the host level component, which means that the GPU uh, itself, like the GPU device itself, will have dedicated container toolkit, whether it's NVIDIA or AMD, which will allow it to be uh, shown inside of a Kubernetes cluster. And on the Kubernetes side, you'll also have device discovery plugin, which will be able to scan and find the different GPUs which will be there inside of the uh, Kubernetes cluster and then, then get assigned to the cluster whenever there is a need for more, uh, more higher compute requirements. Like let's say you're doing training of a machine learning model, so it will be able to detect a uh, dedicated GPU and it will be able to then uh, use that to do the, to, to do the training for you. Uh, and this is generally, if any of you, if, if anyone of you is familiar with uh, the YAML structure, so of course these are files which are used to 
apply deployments or services inside of Kubernetes. Uh, again, if you're not aware of these terms, completely fine. You can uh, take some time today and learn some of the basics of Kubernetes after today's session. But this is generally like a YAML file which will create and essentially what we are seeing over here is that we are defining that we will now supply this particular Kubernetes cluster with two GPUs of NVIDIA. So these two GPUs will be accessible whenever there is a need for you to run the inference uh, or training and there is a need for a GPU cluster, you will be able to apply it to your Kubernetes cluster. Um, so of course that kind of brings us to the topic of what is Kubeflow. So we spoke about that yes, there is an inherent need for GPUs in order to be able to uh, do the inferencing and training of your large models, uh, machine learning models on top, of, on, on top of Kubernetes. But Kubernetes itself is very complex, right? It is uh, not very easy to get started with. And especially if you have just like one or two small models, then it's uh, fine to use just the uh, Kubernetes. But how many of you are aware of the entire machine learning life cycle? Can anyone like describe what are the usual steps involved whenever you work on a machine learning project? Like the four basic steps. Any Anyone aware? Who might have? Yeah. Yeah, if you want to uh, probably share. I, I guess data gathering, data cleaning, uh, making the model and then production. Yeah. So data gathering. That means you're collecting your data, then you're cleaning your data to remove any of the issues that might be there in your data. Then you will actually do feature engineering, which means like picking up those particular features from your data, which are the most important. Then you will do the actual model training where you are training the actual machine learning model with your data. And then you'll do like evaluation, whether your model actually gives good prediction or not. So as you might see that more complex machine learning applications are not just one simple step. There are multiple steps. So as you will see that if you are dealing with a much more complex architecture for machine learning, then in those cases, just a simple deployment on uh, Kubernetes will not work. And that is where we will need uh, more advanced tools like Kubeflow. So basically Kubeflow is a tool, you can think it's an open source project that is built on top of Kubernetes, but it provides you a lot of different tools and services, which allows it for you to make it easier for being able to do machine learning experimentation, deployment, training, all of those things in between. So these uh, are the ones that will help you to get your model training. All of these different steps will make it much easier when you're using Kubeflow. And it runs on top of Kubernetes. So it is a project that you will typically use if you have a much more advanced uh, machine learning operations, or if you have a much larger set of um, multiple machine learning uh, workflows that you're running inside of your company, right? Uh, so that's one of the reasons why you will choose Kubeflow. And here is like uh, the dev like example that I kind of showed all of you, where you know we start as a machine learning engineer, we look at data preparation, then we do the model deployment, then uh, we do some optimization on our model, then we'll do the so model development is where we'll clean the data, right? And then we'll do the model training. Uh, if you want to improve it, we'll do some fine tuning. And finally, we will go ahead and do model serving. So model serving is that, yes, now once the model is good enough, you have to deploy it so that you can use something like an open AI API, right? So that's a perfect example of model serving where open AI is serving the chat GPT API that all of us can leverage and use it, right? So these are the typical steps that are involved in a machine learning lifecycle. And here is where how Kubeflow kind of helps with each of these different steps. So for example, there are different components inside of Kubeflow. So you have notebooks. Uh, how many of you work with Python? So has anyone of you ever heard of the Python notebook? Have you used the Python notebook ever? Or Google Colab? Perhaps Jupyter, yeah, the Python, Jupyter, one of the same thing. Or Google Colab. So these are notebook style uh, applications where you write your Python code in different blocks and you can then execute different blocks. So similarly, uh, you get this Jupyter interface inside of Kubeflow where you can write your entire training scripts and your entire uh, pipelines uh, inside of the notebook itself. Then we have Catib which allows you to do like model training, optimization of your machine learning model. Um, then we have the training operator which is specifically used for the training operations. Then K-service for deployment of your machine learning models. So you get these dedicated um, components inside of Kubeflow 
which allow for you to then make it easier for being able to manage each and every section of your machine learning pipeline. So if all of you are uh, in some point in time looking to go into machine learning and the side of deployment of machine learning, which is a field called as MLOps, you will have to deal with all of this, right? So if you're interested in machine learning, if you're interested in being able to create production grade machine learning ecosystem, this is what you'll have to learn. So of course, for a lot of you, these concepts might be a bit new, but I hope that at least you're able to take away some of these terminologies and then apply them and uh, probably do a bit more of research and get into this particular field. So of course, uh, th this is all of the different uh, components that we have. So we have a centralized dashboard that I'll show very quickly. And then you have all of these different components like the notebooks and of course the training. So these are all new flow components which allow you to manage the different parts of your entire machine learning lifecycle. And here's like a high level kind of overview. So this is like, of course, as you see that everything is built on top of Kubernetes, right? And then you have all of these different components that you can leverage. Of course, it has a very vast ecosystem support as well. So uh, if you want to connect with external Python libraries, there is direct support that you can do in order to have end-to-end -end machine learning pipelines running in production. So it is a very vastly used tool. It was originally uh, started at Google. So of course, Google uses it uh, very much. And then Meta, all of the large companies use uh, Qflu in some of the other form for their machine learning deployments. Like Spotify, all of these companies uh, use these particular tools. And uh, so one of the limitations of Qflu itself, right? So of course, as I mentioned that Kubernetes itself is, com is complex. There is a learning curve involved. But now you introduce machine learning on top of Kubernetes. So as you might imagine that it becomes even more complex. And the reason uh, is, of course, I'll come to that particular point. But here is a user survey for Qflow, which shows that what are the biggest gaps currently in Qflow. So native Qflow, that's, uh, that's the open source Qflow, is the documentation. That people are not happy with the documentation provided from Qflow. And one of the reasons behind that is, that if all of you are aware about what happens whenever you deploy Kubernetes, so of course you, uh, you will come across terminologies like resources, custom resource definitions, deployments, namespaces. These are all terms, uh, you know, like you know, anonymous with uh, Kubernetes. And as you might just look from how many number of resources, how many number of namespaces is actually required in order to deploy Qflow. You can imagine that it is extremely, extremely hard, right? Especially for someone who is a beginner, uh, this can be very daunting. It is daunting. I'll be very frank. And again, it's not to scare anyone. It just has so many components. And that's why like, we are talking today about some Qflow, which is a way for you to be able to simplify the deployment of Qflow. So that's the reason why that the documentation is not that great. And then it is complex. It is very complex. So again, not to scare off anyone, it is, right? But that's why like, we have tools like Charm Qflow. So basically, Charm Qflow is an open source end-to-end production-ready MLOps platform that is provided, of course, by the canonical folks. And uh, it is essentially an abstraction layer built on top of the basic Qflow. But it provides you, of course, um, the ability for you to essentially uh, use uh, the CKF, it is a charm uh, uh, Qflow. Uh, you essentially, it is like a wrapper on top of, uh, you know, like how we have so many wrapper startups today being built on top of like chat GPT. You, some of you might have heard of wrapper startups, which are basically like just providing you a simple use case built on top of chat GPT, right? How many of you have probably used like a chat with PDF doc, which allows you to just upload a PDF and you get this chat with it, right? There's so many of these wrapper startups. So you can think of, uh, of course, but uh, Charm Qflow is a, is a good wrapper. It's not a bad wrapper. It's a very good wrapper because it reduces a lot of the different complexities. And how does it accomplish that? So it uses Juju, uh, which allows you to abstract away a lot of the different complexities when it comes to deployment of the different uh, Qflow components that are required for you to set up, right? So if you were not using Charm Qflow, you are Probably I'll, I'll be very confident in saying that if you are new to Kubernetes, if you're new to Qflow, you are bound to fail 75 to 80% of the times and you will probably run into an error with Q, with Kubernetes. But if you're using Charm Qflow, that will reduce way, way less, right? So uh, that's one of the reasons why you should, you should probably choose uh, 
the jump influence instead of uh, just the native Kubernetes. Uh, so of course, like this reduces that administrative burden when it comes to setting it up. Now, of course, there are certain caveats that it is a bit less. Um, you know, if you ask me, like, okay, what is the downside of using it? So I would say that it, it is a bit less configurable as compared to main Kubernetes uh, Kubeflow, but it generally covers, I would say, ninety percent of all the different use cases that you would typically use inside of native Kubeflow. So that's the main reason, right? Why why you should choose uh, the main Tom Kubeflow instead of the upstream Kubeflow. And of course, how to basically set it up. So these are the high level steps. So first, you need a Kubernetes environment. So first thing you will do is that you will set up micro gates. Then you will install Zuzu, which will be your main manager for being able to manage all of your different dependencies. <laughs> then uh, you would basically add the Kubeflow model. And then you would go ahead and run some scripts to actually deploy your uh, Tom Kubeflow. And then, of course, you would need to set up your ingress controller for you to be able to actually get access uh, to the database access um, and configure it. And then you can verify by going to the Kubeflow dashboard. Now, I will request it that uh, I have to finish a bit earlier. So, the exact steps that I was originally supposed to follow in this live demo, I, I will just share the link that you can follow. And uh, I also actually have like a dedicated um, <coughs> GitHub list that I will share with everyone. And you can follow this list. I was about to basically follow them. But I can just give you like a high level overview. So, the first thing that we do is that we install microcates. Then we set the relevant permissions for it, and then we just verify once the micro gates. As I mentioned, that micro gates is a distribution for Kubernetes for uh, offered by Canonical and for Ubuntu. And then you install Juju, and uh, once you have installed Juju, you add the Kubeflow dedicated Kubeflow module, and then you go ahead and actually deploy your Charm Kubeflow interface. And uh, then what you do is that you configure your dashboard access where now um, you basically do the port forwarding so that you can get access to that particular Kubeflow cluster, right? Uh, so basically I have a CVO dashboard. So CVO is a uh, Kubernetes provider um, for which I'm, I have basically deployed a couple of Ubuntu instances. So I'll just quickly go ahead into my dashboard and show all of you the two different uh, clusters that I have running. Um, so inside of the compute instance, I have uh, two currently running Kubeflow clusters. Uh, so, so one is a VM which has already configured the entire Tom Kubeflow instance. And the next one is the one that I was supposed to actually set up because, because of limitation of time. You can just follow this particular markdown file and you'll be able to set it up in probably less than like 20, 30 minutes. So you'll have like a working uh, example of Kubeflow in less than 30 minutes with the help of, again, Tom Kubeflow. So um, basically, I will use the example of the already deployed cluster. So in this case, um, the command that I'm supposed to basically run is, um, so what you're seeing over here is um, I'm running like port forwarding because my actual uh, cluster itself, right? Uh, my my uh, cluster is this one. So this is the actual VM which has the Kubeflow cluster deployed. So in order to, of course, like get access to the Kubeflow dashboard, uh, which requires a GUI. Since I'm not using Ubuntu natively, I'm going to be using port forwarding so that I can get access to that cluster and I can run it locally in my Mac. So that is why I'm going to be running this particular command, which is uh, I'm using like port, port forwarding with my SFX and I'm going to be um, running this on localhost uh, 8080. So once I just go ahead and do that, I should be able to go to my um, localhost 8080. And this is my Kubeflow, complete Kubeflow dashboard. And again, I was able to set it up by following this entire, um, you know, GitHub uh, just in less than like 20 minutes. So it's that easy to set up with the help of Tom Kubeflow. And here what you'll see is that the different components that we talked about, uh, including notebooks. So notebooks is where you can basically have dedicated Python notebooks. I can quickly also show you one of these. Um, so this will actually open up a Python notebook where you can actually execute your entire machine learning pipeline code. And um, so I'll just wait for it to open, but then you have things like pipelines. So if, I, if you have an entire machine learning pipeline, you can very easily go ahead and deploy it over here. Um, and then of course you have things like experiments that you can run. Uh, so these are all the different uh, components that you get within your entire uh, cluster, right? So um, back to, of course, our slides. 
this is how you basically set up the queue flow. And of course, when you set it up for the first time, it will ask you to basically also add like a username and a password. And then you add that and you get this landing screen which I just showed you. So that's the deployed um, entire interface for uh, Charm queue flow that you're seeing right now, with the including the documentation. So of course we covered the different components, including notebooks, pipelines, CATIP, which is used for experimentation and being able to do optimization of your machine learning models. Then TensorBoard is where you can visualize the performance of your machine learning model that you're training. Um, and of course, I just showed you like a quick demo of uh, John you flew this right now. Um, and the one thing that I just wanted to quickly cover in like in a minute is that uh, of course I work at Couchbase, so we also have a vector database. Uh, how many of you have heard of the term retrieval augment, augmented generation, rack, right? So in typically in a rack system, what happens is that if you just ask a random question to a large language model, we of course might have heard of this term called as hallucination, right? So it gives a random response. But if you add an external data to it, uh, like an external, external uh, you know, project or some kind of documentation, then it will be able to give you a better result. So that's rack. But then you can further improve the performance of the entire model by fine tuning the actual model itself. So generally people have this question that should you do either fine tuning of the model itself or use rack. But my suggestion is why not use both and you get the benefits of actually being able to use both where you're getting better answers but your model itself is much, light, much less likelier to actually do a hallucination because there's always a chance in rack itself that your model might give you a random response. But if you're fine tuning it and using that, so this is where um, in my company I use uh, Qflow specifically for using rack plus fine tuning where I have a rack system using the vector database offered by Couchbase. But then the large language model that I'm using for inferencing, I will typically run it with the help of the Qflow pipelines uh, because there is a training operator inside of Qflow pipelines which allows you to fine tune uh, AI models and I'll use that to fine tune my model and then I'll add it back to my pipeline and that way I'll be able to get access to that particular cluster. So um, that's a real world production example of how we use Qflow inside of my company. And of course if you're interested to know uh, to learn more, uh, since I'm a Qflow Google Sound Code mentor as well, I'll be more than happy to cover more use cases and how all of you can actually start contributing to Qflow as well. Uh, I'll be more than happy to answer your questions because I've been part of the Qflow community for uh, and part of the release team for Qflow for almost like two years now. Uh, so with that, like of course we are out of time. These are some MLOps best practices. Uh, feel free to kind of take a picture of this. Otherwise, I'll be more than happy to share the slide links with all of you. And uh, these are some of the resources. So I'll definitely uh, recommend everyone to take a look. So these include docs on how you set up uh, Charmed Qflow, uh, this, uh, the GitHub gist that I just covered, and some of the documentation around how you do AI modeling inside of Qflow. Um, and uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. If you have any questions, I'll be around and I'll be more than happy to answer any questions related to Qflow, related to machine learning as well. Thank you so much.